Praise God. Amen. Good morning. Can we put our hands again and give God the glory this morning? Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Well, I would like to welcome those that are here for the first time. Certainly, we, we appreciate you here. Thank you. Can we give God glory for the first timers, please? Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Met a couple this morning, and so today you're, you're a visitors. Next week when you come back, you're no longer visitors. You're a family. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, today's, uh, again, I said it's a beautiful Sunday morning. It started raining, didn't it? And it didn't stop us from coming. And uh, because we, we just want to be in the presence of the king. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, would you please stand along with me? Mark chapter 4. And we will go right into the word this morning. Mark chapter 4. Starting with verse 4. Mark chapter 4, 35, I mean, I'm sorry. Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35, and says, And on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in a boat as he was, and, and other little boats were also with him. And a great storm, a windstorm, arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was about, was already overfilling. But he was in the storm, he was in the stern, the back side of the boat, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The question they said, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Then he arose and he abrigged the wind and said to the sea, Be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. And said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Wow, that's powerful. That is the God we serve. Would you please kindly bow your head? Father, again, we thank you this morning. And I pray, God, that you would prepare our hearts uh, to receive your word. Your word is alive. And so, therefore, I ask you, clear our thoughts, our mind. We come against any distraction that might hinder your word. I pray, God, that you will strengthen each one of us by your word. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone will say, amen. And before you are seated, would you give somebody a high five? And you may be seated. High five. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I, I do that all the time because I want somebody to, somebody is sleeping, so wake them up. Make, make it stronger. All right. You know, when I was reading the Word, and, and uh, perhaps it's not uh, ancient to you that there are so many things going on this in our generation, isn't it? There are so many things, and, and I just want to, I pray for this, and it's my prayer, and it's not an exhaustive study, but it's my prayer that you'll be strengthened. The, the message this morning is that, that we will have a little bit of understanding of how God is in relation to us and how he deals with us as children. It is my prayer that before the end of the celebration, you will be so, uh, so, so in love with the Lord that you will understand whatever might happen to you that you have a God that is faithful, that loves you, that he has a plan for you, and it will settle most of all who you are in Christ. I've been telling the message this morning in, in, in part is uh, trusting God and also in part two. Last week I talked about part one, and that is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Do you remember that? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out in your understanding and all your ways you can help you, and he will direct your path. That's part of one. But today, I'd like for us to consider this, this message, a faithful, loving God, and how can we relate to the natural calamities or disasters that includes um, the, the plagues, famine, sickness? How do you reconcile this? Um, one of the things that, as a pastor, um, I have to look at um, what's going on around our our area our region and in the world what's happening what what's what are the things that that are that are like about to break uh things uh that are happening and so my intention is that not for me just to have a satisfaction but say god what are you telling us is that something that you and i re recently uh, last week uh, several weeks ago we had what we had uh hurricanes uh in 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 um, first was uh hurricane harvey in texas and then after that, followed by what? By Hurricane 
Irma. It was designated as a category five. And then as, as, as we begin, and here's the thing about this, if you're reading, the, if you're watching the news and reading it, you would see that anything that, that brings out the attention of the media, they rise up. It's like a, it's like a big thing. Of course, they need to make sure that everything is, 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 uh, is televised for our information. And I was seeing that. I said, category three, four, and five. And it went through Caribbean, and it destroyed um, uh, buildings. And, and they even showed one of the islands. It was former. It was green. And then suddenly, when after the typhoon came off, or hurricane that we call them, we call them typhoon here, uh, it, was, it was brown, and so nothing. And people kept asking what happened, right? And then it went through Florida. As a matter of fact, last week we had Pastor Nebby. Uh, they were here from, uh, from Florida, and hopefully they're, they're, they're okay. And so, and so those are things that are happening. And, and of course, people ask God what's going on. 2000, 10 years ago, come December, one of the largest or the most massive uh, disaster came 2004 December 26 2004 uh, a tsunami hit 14 countries in this in, the, in in Asia do you remember that right and the earthquake and then the tsunami came out and and you know how many people died uh, lost their lives 200,000 lost their lives and millions lost their homes and and you begin to say wow is this something it is a recorded 2004 and there were so many people that as you and I know, you have to ask yourself, uh, no, it's something that is, is what's going on? Uh, is this something that, that, that is just happening haphazardly? Is it just momentarily, or is it something? Now, one of the things that we have learned as you continue to, uh, to live in this world, uh, there are things that, you know, they're, 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 there's what I call their patterns. They continue to, uh, uh, to happen in, in areas and... and uh, and one of the things that I've learned is this, life goes on. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that in, in, a, in a very uh, demeaning way, but, but life continues to move on. Amen? And the thing is this, what, when, when, we do, when we do that, were there any other things that happened in other places? Now, let me read to you some of the things that happened before we have even the recording uh, of, all, of what we have now. Throughout history, we had earthquakes, hurricanes, typhoons, pl plagues. In 526 AD, in the place called now Turkey, look at this. In 526 AD, uh, it was found out that an earthquake hit the country, and about 250,000 died. A similar earthquake in China in 1556 killed about 830,000 people. Another earthquake in India, 1737 the year 30, 1737 killed about 300,000 in quakes in central China. In 1920, 1927, 1932 killed 200, 200,000, 70,000 um, consecutively. And even the United States, there were this dam that, was, uh, that broke off. And, and in 1969, over 2,000 people lost their lives. And these are on and on and on. And we can ask ourselves... What's going on, isn't it? Where is God? Why? Um, one was uh, in 2004, a, a, a woman lost her family, and she was alone. That was the survivor, and she asked, God, what did we do to offend you? Why are you so angry? And I'm saying like, those are things that, that, are, uh, that are, in terms of their context, it's legitimate. Why did you, why did we die? And, 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 and this question by a Greek philosopher by the name of Epicurus, it says, is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent, meaning he's malicious or, or uh, mean. Is he both able and willing? Then when does come evil? Is he neither able or willing? Then why call him God? That is the mind of a person who studied philosophy, and when they see the things happening, if there is God, they would ask, why is he allowing this to happen? Isn't that a legitimate question? Now, when we read that text on Mark, Jesus Christ was with his disciples, and there's a difference between 
uh, being knowing about something about Jesus and having a personal relationship. When you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you have a working knowledge of a relationship, it is like being married. It's like having a relationship. You come together and you begin to know each other. What Jesus Christ was doing is this. Listen to this very carefully. It's very important for the context of our message. It's this. When we begin to understand who Jesus is in our relationship, there might be things that will happen along the way, but Jesus Christ will always reveal the redemptive purpose. So here our disciples were with him. They went in the boat, and suddenly a big windstorm came about. Now remember, mind you, these are fishermen. They know what to see, what look for, uh, for, for the, uh, during the during storm. But in that moment, in that moment, all the things that they knew about navigation, all the things they knew about that, uh, uh, but, but that, that part of water, it went overboard. It went overboard. Why? Because they know they were no longer in control. And Jesus Christ, in purpose, he was sleeping so that they began to ask him, don't you care? Haven't you had that question before? Don't you care that my family is this? Don't you care why are we this? Don't you care why my, this and so suffering from this sickness? Don't you care that there are many millions of people that are suffering? Don't you care? That is a question of a person who has never had an understanding or a thought that our God is supreme and he's the way he wants us to understand because there are many things that we need to understand. So where does God, when is this? And we begin to understand why. Now, the first thing that we need to go is this. And here's the thing, and, and, and I struggled with this. As an electrical engineer by profession, when I was in college and even before I became a pastor, numbers matter to me. You know, when you put them one plus one, it has to be two, and that makes sense. One and plus one is two. Is that true? Yeah? One plus one is two, right? As far as I know, elementary, yeah. So that makes sense. My mind says, yeah. But when I see things, I, I try to connect with the numbers the way I understand them, and I always sit a wall. Have you seen that when something happens in something where you try to, ex try to explain it, and then you, instead of you having a soft heart, you begin to be what? To be hard-hearted because it doesn't negate. It doesn't, it, it doesn't match up. So in this thought, Isaiah like this, it says, here's what God is saying. My thoughts, God is declaring to each one of us, my thoughts are not your thoughts. In other words, the one who created the brain, and you and I are using about maybe 10%, Maybe 10%, maybe. I don't know. That's why somebody says, hey, uh, doc, if you have any brain, if you need a brain uh, transplant, use that person because he it's, 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 it's seldom used. No? So it says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And it says, my ways are not your ways. Once you begin to understand that without you, without saying, God, I don't really understand. Of course, you will never. It will take life and a half to understand God. You will have, you and I will never have in a million years, understand God because he's, he's omniscient. And then when we begin to understand that, you begin to settle down. Why is that? Because it is very important to know that when you begin to settle down, God can begin to teach each one of us instead of saying, why did you do this? Do you know there are many people living now, in this, in the, in, even in church, they can't seem to, God can seem to get into their hearts simply because there was a situation that caused them to lose their faith in God. It could have been a sickness, it could have been a death, it could have been something, it could have been sort of this, and they begin to clamp down and says, God, why did you do this to me? Not realizing that God has a better purpose. And then the psalmist, I mean, uh, Paul on Romans, it says, it says on, uh, the writer says, Oh, the depths of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable. How unsearchable. David was saying, God, he says, if I look to the heavens, I can see your majesty. David, a shepherd boy, understood the simplicity of having a heart that wants to know about his creator. And he said, oh, God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And he began, and God says, ah, this is a vessel that I want to input my wisdom. 
how unsearchable are his judgment and how unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? Our God reigns. Now we come to the point then, how come things are happening the way? Well, if you're a Christian, you know this already. Because of the fall, God created in Genesis chapter 1, you can tell it, in the beginning, God created everything that is beautiful. In the beginning, God created, there was no form, and God created everything. Go back to Genesis 1, and 1, 2, and 3, before 3, you would see that everything that he created is so wonderful in its season, its time. And then come what? Come the fall of man. And then it was cursed. It was cursed because of the fall of man. Now, here's the struggle. The struggle to understand a good God and the fact of natural disasters. Look at this on John chapter 1 uh, that, that is already there. That John chapter 1, verse 1 and 3. As Jesus Christ was passing by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. All right? And as he was his disciple, asked him, saying, Master. Now, they trying to, people were trying to trap him, but the, but, but, but the disciples had Master. Who sinned? This is a blind man. Let's get somebody to blame. Isn't that? Isn't that something that we all of us want to do? We blame others. We blame anything so that it becomes satisfactory to our senses. We have to blame someone. Now because I'm like this, because of something happened, we never seem to get hold of. And Jesus Christ, look at it, says, Who did sin, his parents, or that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents. But the last thing is this, the redemption of God is this. But the work, that the works of the Lord should be manifested in him. That the work of the Lord, he said, no, I think it might be a natural, could perhaps something happen, but God is saying, nobody sinned. Perhaps sin was part of something, but he says, we can redeem it so that the work of the Lord can be manifested. Why am I saying this? Each one of us has a good news to share with others. Can somebody say amen? Each one of us, what you go and I go through may be bad in our our own self. But God can redeem that so that those who do not know him, I said those who do not know him, can be encouraged by what we testify of who God is. You and I know that when we receive Christ, our name are written in the Lamb's book of life, and we can live. But there are others who are asking, questioning, why is this happening to me? There's a natural order of things. There's that. There's the spiritual order of things as well. There's cause and effect. If, if you plant a seed, it will birth out. Amen? If you plant sin, it will come out as death. And so he says this, there's nothing. He says, Jesus Christ says this, that no one is to be blamed, but I can still redeem from this situation. Now, this morning, my intention is this, not to, again, this is just a partial part, but my intention is this, while we are seeing, you and I know what's going on, right? Because of the tension of what's happening. When you begin to take out God in the country, then there's a void, and there's just, it just, a, 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 it begins, uh, it's like ripple effect. So this morning, I'd like for us to consider these 10 reasons why somehow, for understanding, God allows calamities, disasters come, not because he wants to, but because there's that progression of cause and effect, and why sometimes we might feel ourselves, there's sickness in the family or things that we don't understand and with this, 10 reasons why, why we are alive. All right? Number one is this. As Christians, for us to sell our hearts this, God wants us to realize that we must be totally dependent upon God. Totally dependent upon God. Number one, one of the reasons is there are many. One is this, that you and I will begin to sell our hearts and say, God, I don't really understand what's going on. But faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It will be redeemed. Jesus Christ in his prayer told us this prayer, when it's Lord's Prayer, give us our daily bread. 
Don't worry about tomorrow, he says. Today's even, you got your own problems now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Number one is this. He wants us to be drawn closer and to be dependent upon God. Number two. Number two is this. It, wants us, it causes us to call upon God in the day of trouble. He wants us to call upon in the day of trouble. As much as possible, we are men and women of we want to do it our way. Especially when you're a type A person, you want to do everything in your way. Sometimes God puts you in a situation because there's something to be broken. Sometimes God will take you to a place so that one day he says, I, I can't do anything. Psalms 50 verse 15 says, call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Number three is this. To make us realize we need each other. One of the most beautiful uh, examples um, that, 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 was, that was televised was during Hurricane Harvey in Texas. All right? They were warned. And people, because of, they were shown helping one another. It is like saying, I am part of what's going through you. I'm going to say, I'm going to do my part. God is saying this, that when calamity comes, it is not time for us to shy away. It is not time for us to pull up. But instead of what? We need to be open to those that may need it most. Recently, if you notice, there were people, there were cops, firemen, I believe, that were on the intersection of Marine Drive. You know what they're getting? They were raising funds uh, for Hurricane Harvey and I think for Irma. They were saying, you know what? We want you to know that we are part of you. See, sometimes, isn't it? See, sometimes we enclose ourselves. Here in the island of Guam, it's so difficult to sometimes meet people. You know why? Number one is this, our transportation, you have to have your own car. Otherwise, you have to have the uh, G, uh, Guam uh, What's it called? Huh? Transit. So in other countries, you can actually have your own. And so what happens is this. From your home, all right, you go home, you sleep, go to your, in your car, go somewhere, buy your car, buy your own. And so nothing. But then it is not the way. It should be what? We need to know and live one another. Number four is this. To remind us that life is short. To remind us life is short. Life is still too short at its longest. Life is still too short at its longest. There are many people here in my class. Um, if you reach 55, anybody? Uh, don't raise your hands. I know you already, but don't let people know that you're, if you're 55, hey amen, you're past uh, 50. <laughs> you're, you, you, you made a 50 roll call. And it's some sort of saying, man, it was just, I just blink and I got married. Blink, I got kids. Blink, I got grandkids. Blink, I'm, where did time go? No matter how much you and I think that we can pull time back, still too short. Amen? Still too short. And as much as it's appointed for a man to die once, and it's appointed, number five is this. It is very important to set our priorities in order. Do you know people tend to not, uh, not understand that if you give your life, which is probably good, that you work your life at the expense of your family relationship, here's what happens, right? A person who works in an office give their life for that company, all right? And then I want this and then, and then we, at the expense of their family. If that person uh, gets sick, Guess what happened? And went to the hospital, and uh, God forbid, the sickness led to death. Isn't this very important? Guess what happened? When he dies, he'll be mourned. They'll have, they'll go to the funeral, after the burial, they'll go home to their to the family to their family and eat uh, eat. Uh, you know how that is, right? You have that after, after merienda, when you, and after that, 
the next day, guess what? Your office is still there. And your office mates will begin to say, you get that little table, you get that chair, you get that pencil, you get that. Everything that you think is important will be, be distributed and your name, you will just be a memory. And that is the fact of life. But what he's simply saying is this, you still can do that, but don't forget about the goodness of the Lord. Paul says this, everything that I've done is but nothing. I just want to know my God. Priority number one, somebody says, I want my God first, and then family, and then what? Um, children, and then work. That's my priority, right? Some people say that, but that is wrong. God must be God, number one. God must be number one in your family. God must be number one in your children. God must be number one in your work. God must be number one. You don't put a hierarchy so that he becomes this, but do this. You have to be, God must be all in all, like last week, be mindful of who he is so that you don't lose sight of your relationship with God. So God, God in your family, God in your office, God in your work, God in your recreation, God in your studies, God must always be there. He is not isolated that you pick him up when you need him. He has to be there. God doesn't want him to be your co-pilot. He never wants to be, when somebody says, God is my co-pilot. No, 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 no. God doesn't want to be the co-pilot. God wants to be the pilot. God wants to be the pilot. So what it is, we begin to say, God, what do you want me to do? Number six is this, to remind us of the curse of sin. And that is where we see things happening around us. Because of the sin, something happened, and so it broke the beautiful creation of God. But you still see the beauty of God, but that, because of sin, it says, cursed is the ground for your sake. In other words, the ground used to be blessing all the rain, and now it has to, he, man has to work. Why? Because the ground has been, has been cursed. It has to be worked at. Curse. And God understands that the things that you hear and see are, are when ha things happening, there are the natural occurrence, and you begin to, God, please help us. Help us. Number seven is this. When you see situations are like this, it is a call of, to repentance, to be what? Repentance and being sorry. Repentance is simply saying, God, I forgive me, I've sinned. Repentance, Second Chronicles 7 to 40, if my people are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their weak way, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Sometimes situations cause us to be closer to God. In the book of Acts, the Philippian jailer, when he was there, an earthquake happened, and he couldn't, he couldn't understand. He shouted, he says, what must I do to be saved, isn't it? Sometimes God causes Paul, who used to be uh, Saul of Tarsus, he was, he was a man of his own uh, ways, and God has to make him blind for a season, uh, fall him off on his horse, and to say, God, it was... For him, it was a loss of his eyesight and all the things, and yet God has a redemption. Sometimes God causes these things for us to say, God, I need you more than anything. Amen? It is something that we, you and I need to understand. When something happens, we need to say, God, what are you telling me? Are you telling me something? Are you telling me that I need to shape up or shape out? Matthew 24, verse 6 and 8 says this. In Matthew 24, and you read this. The things that are happening, happening right now, it says in verse 24, uh, chapter 24, Matthew, the disciple says, when will this thing happen? And one of them is this. And wars will break out near and far, but don't panic. Yes, these are the things that must come, but the end might won't follow immediately. The nations and kingdoms will claim war against each other, and there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but this is the only the beginning of of the horrors to come. Sometimes God is calling each one of us through what's happening around us. says, God, you understand. You have been to Sunday school. You know what's going to happen. Something is about to break. These are the, just the birth pangs. He says, these are the beginning of suffering. But lo and behold, I'm here to redeem. 
what's happening in the world. Number eight is this, an announcement of the second coming of Jesus Christ. An announcement of second coming of Jesus Christ. What happens is this, when we begin to be so in, 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 in involved with the world that this is where God is saying, no, this is not what I want. This one of these days it will be burned into pieces, but I want you to know that you are a citizen of heaven. Don't want for a moment this the way it is now. God is saying, I am coming back again to redeem it. Joel 1 15 says, For the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction. He is coming back again. God, Jesus Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is coming back in. All the things that we are seeing, all the things that we are seeing right now are just a burnt pangs of what is about to take place. And so there's got to be a preparation for each one of us. Number nine, this is the end of certainty of, of the end. These things are happening. All things, these are the beginning of sorrow. God is saying this, this is just the beginning. And I says, Pastor, I thought that was the, I thought your message is redemptive, right? I said, man, Pastor, I feel more, more, more confused now than ever. Don't worry. It, you, you will, it will clear up with this number, five, number 10. is this, to show God's power to restore. To show God's power to restore. You and I may not understand what's happening, but he's saying is this, Behold, I make all things new. Everything, one of these days, it will come into focus and we will understand. But in the meantime, we cannot have a life that is always complaining, that is always asking something that God says, by faith, believe me, that I know what I'm doing. You and I will have so much time to ask him we're in heaven. But in the meantime, we may not understand everything. I do not understand everything. You and I, I do not understand. But just say, believe, he says, believe, and it shall come to pass. God is saying this. The way it is now, he's redeeming. Look at what, how God did it in a beautiful tapestry. Man fell and earth was cursed. Jesus Christ was promised as the Messiah. He came 2,000 years ago, but it wasn't then yet. There'll be a time that the redemption of man will be completed. In the meantime, there'll be, says, there'll be rumors of wars, there'll be earthquake. Who's saying this? Jesus Christ himself. There's nothing new on this world. Everything is happening, but we may not understand it. But then he says, I will make all things new. That is a promise that God. So when you see things, it's not so, when you see things, hurricanes and all the other things, those are very brutal. Uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot lessen them. Earthquakes, tsunamis, those are things that will continue to happen. And God is still God. He can control it. He can do it. But in the meantime, we have free will that we need to. It is God's sovereignty and man's free will. An example would be this. Example, a place the uh, the, uh, the uh, seismologists and the uh, and and all the angels says this place is a fault line and because you want to live in that fault line when that happens then you cannot blame god saying god why did you let earthquake happen when you and i have been warned so many many times and god is saying i'm here to give redemption to you God is still in control. Amos says this, and I want it. He who forms us, he forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thought to man. He who turns dawn into darkness and treads the high place of the earth, the Lord God is almighty. God is still in control. The questions that we have now will continue. But in the meantime, have faith in the almighty God that is in control. There's a timeline that is fulfilling, and you can see, 1948, the nation of Israel was birthed out, and from that point on, the things that are happening in magnitudes seems to accelerate. Why? There are signs that God is saying, listen to what's happening, the birth fangs of what's happening. One of these days, the trumpet will sound, and Jesus Christ will come back again. Mark this, Christ died, Christ has risen, Christ 
is coming back again. Amen? Hallelujah. So in this one, what do we do then? When we understand about that, um, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 29, let me just read in closing. It says here, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 29, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears the word of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and slams against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus Christ had finished these words, the crowd were amazed at his teaching. The word amazed says, huh, wow. Some of them says, huh, wow. And they came and they went back to the old ways. But there were others, and wow. And they said, it's this. For he was teaching them as having an authority and not just as scribes. See, when we read the word, when we listen to the word, we can be amazed. Say, oh, that's good. That's a good word. But there's a difference between, ah, that's a good word, and internalize it. It is my prayer this morning. May you and I be at peace in the midst of what's going on around us. May you and I understand that we can still be in peace while Jesus Christ is with us. May you and I bring hope to those, not also in those that have been in situations of destruction, but simply those people that are going through could be sickness or illnesses that we can bring hope to them because you and I are carrying the good news of Jesus Christ. And good news means Jesus Christ loves them and has a plan for each one of them. Would you please bow your heads for a moment? Lord, again, we thank you this morning. We thank you, God, that, that there may, if, uh, we pray, and God forbid, that, Lord, even in our island, it is, uh, it is called an, uh, it is right there in the uh, Typhoon Alley. And, uh, and because of that, we prepare. We, we have different types of, of, uh, of materials to build our homes because we know that we are in direct path of any typhoons. And, and you call it wise. But oh God, at the same time, there are, there are situations we cannot control. Things that we might hurt our hearts and, and bring into question your love and your faithfulness. But, oh, God, we can never understand your greatness. I pray, God, that you bring upon our hearts a heart that, that not only will ask questions and, and, and point our fingers at you, but a hands that will extend help, our mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. I pray, God, in any circumstance, situation, that we can bring forth hope that is in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you this morning, and and we pray for our families that are affected, even in the Caribbean, in Texas, in in Florida, and even the fires uh, that is raging in the Northwest, or even in the places, and even those that, that are getting going through the typhoon season in Asia. Lord, there's so much that we don't understand. But I pray, Father, that we will not, will not put doubts in our hearts, but instead that we will settle in our hearts that you are still in control. In any season, we will worship you. You created the world. You created us. And I pray, God, that in this moments of uncertainty that we will stick closer to you. Lord, I pray this morning that you settle each heart. Whether a family member is going through a sickness, whether we lost a loved one untimely, or whether there's, there's this loss of, of promotions or relationship that, that was uh, broken, Father, in time, you made all things beautiful, and you will redeem. I pray, God, that we will submit ourselves to you and to your lordship. 
while every heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just want to let you know this very important message. God loves you and he's a, has a plan for you. Brother and sister, God loves you and he has a plan for you. But we are separated by sin. Sin separated us and been cursed. The word of God in Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No amount of trying to be good can ever satisfy, can ever pay back. No religion can ever pay back our salvation. Romans 6, 23 also declares, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The wages, is, in, in other words, if we continue in our sin, it is a death separation, a spiritual death. But that is, doesn't end there. God is saying, but the gift of God, a gift, is eternal life. A gift cannot be bought. A gift cannot be paid. A gift is, is something that is given wholeheartedly to someone. But a gift can be rejected or can be accepted. And it's the same thing as with our Father. He's offering each one of us. For those who have not yet known Jesus Christ, God the Father, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is saying this. Yes, I know you're a sinner. Yes, I know you are separate from me, but I'm giving you a gift, a bridge that will take you from where you are into where I am, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave his life. His blood was shed for you. So you may ask, how am I going to do that? By just simply believing that the blood that was sacrificed, the death of Calvary is enough, it is the equal, is more than equal to pay back the wages of sin, the penalty of sin. And to confess Jesus Christ, accept Him in your heart and confess Jesus Christ with your mouth as your Lord and Savior. Would you like to do that? If you want to do that, I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I confess that I'm a sinner, guilty of separation from you. No amount of good things, good works will ever, ever save me. For the, pay for the payment of sin deserves the shed blood. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. He is God himself. He came as a man. He died for me. His blood was shed. The Passover Lamb of God. My sins are washed. My sins are forgiven. So this morning, I invite Jesus Christ Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. I accept you as my Lord. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I also accept you not only as my Savior, but my Lord. Not only my co-pilot, but the pilot of my life. I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me as I trust in you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everyone will say amen and amen and amen. Can we put our heads together? Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Look at your neighbor. Give him a high five. Amen. God bless you.